your kid can do this. Like, let us show you how much your kid can do and like kind of prove you wrong, right? Like don't, don't swaddle, don't shelter, just like show them how much they can do. And then they're going to prove to you they'll do more than you think they can. Throw out homework, worksheets, ominous buildings, hall passes, herds of students, grades, all of it. What would you build? If you start with the amazing thing that is a young person, how would you honor all of their strengths and abilities? How would you remember that this is about them? If Dewey was right, and education is not preparation for life, education is life itself. We need to do more than rebuild schooling. We need to rethink living. Welcome to the Education is Life podcast, where we are having honest discussions on the state of education, where it is, where it can be, and all of the stories in between. Welcome. Today we have uh, Pavel with us. He's the newest guy to Greenfields Academy, and he's just about completed his first year with us. Welcome to Education is Life, Pavel. Uh, thanks. Nice to be here. Yeah. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Pavel. I grew up in and around Chicago, uh, although I was uh, born out of the country in Poland. I always thought I'd be ending up in like a science or engineering kind of background. It was kind of my trajectory for most of my life. That was my plan. And so I went to engineering school. I went to computer science grad school in Montreal and school in New York City. I been a brief time in Japan. I kind of like did all these things. And a couple of years ago, I, uh, a real sort of uh, moment where I s- ended up starting teaching rather unintentionally. And I was teaching at a place called Bitspace where we were doing summer camps and workshops and stuff. And I was teaching the age of kid that I'm mostly teaching now, uh, kind of like later elementary to, in, through the middle school. I've discovered that it's a real passion of mine ever since. It's been like that, like the journey towards discovering what like a purpose was and what, what passion means. I've always had uh, a lot of focus on my, uh, my career and my job in my life. Like I've always wanted to have a strong connection between like personal purpose and like job purpose. And it has only really been like these past five, six years where that's really started to match up. Um, and that w- frankly, it wasn't because I tried to, it's because I happened to kind of stumble into it. And I'm like, oh yeah, this is important. This is really important. And, um, and so it's been a really great matchup. You talked about doing camps and after school stuff at, at Bitspace. What type of learning was that? Is it similar to what you're doing now or is it something else? I got to say, it's actually, uh, it is very similar in some ways. Like it is frighteningly similar in one, some ways and very, very different in others. Um, so what we did there is we, we tried to be sort of like a STEM educational um, after school and elective program. Uh, so for schools that couldn't provide that we would in an after school environment, or we would do it, uh, on site at one of our locations. And then we would also would offer break camps, uh, day off camps, summer camps, week long camps, etc. And, um, we focused largely on, uh, on building things, a lot of wood shop work, uh, a lot of like laser cutting, electronics, programming, 3D modeling. So like making stuff, right? The maker movement was really big for us. Uh, and so therefore it was all very project based. Um, it was also very student led and student driven, I'd even say, uh, at ages even younger than, than I think that we even do at Greenfields. Like we had six year olds, uh, designing their own projects and like determining their outcomes. And, uh, and it was exciting. Like, and I mean, of course we would, we would train them, uh, and, 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 uh, watch them and monitor them very closely. But like we'd have six year olds building skateboards, right? Like how wild is that? And like, it was just such a, a sea change moment where you realize just how much they could do and how much more they could do than I would have ever frankly given them credit for. Um, and then just to realize just how powerful self-motivation is, like just showing them that they can means that like in 85, 90% of the time they will um, because they want to, because they can see that they can do it. And frankly, like we had this sort of bit of a kind of a counterculture bent where we're like, yeah, like your kid can do this. Like, let us show you how much your kid can do and like kind of prove you wrong, right? Like don't, don't swaddle, don't shelter, just like show them how much they can do. And then they're going to prove to you, they'll do more than you think they can. One of our, um, I would say even actually our key interview question for guides at Bitspace, we actually use the same word as you guys do, um, as we do now as guides at Bitspace was, um, can you give us an example of a skill you learned as the result of doing a project, right? 
because like for us, that was this key thing we were trying to teach and to show was that like you have the goal of, let's say, uh, building a box that you want to hold your personal treasures, right? Okay. So that means that you have this goal, everything around you in this room and the capabilities that we have, we can equip you with the skills. You just have to do the work, right? But we're not going to like hold your hand and do the work for you or walk you through step by step. We're going to show you all the things you need to do. We're going to give you all the tools on how to draw it, figure it out, math it out, you know, depending on age range, right? If you're 12, we're going to make you do a lot more math and fractions work than if you're six, right? We're going to like, we fudge where we need to. But fundamentally, it's like you have to sort of think through this and then the result, however amazing or broken or mediocre or mind blowing it is, is yours. Right. And that no matter what happened there, you also learned uh, a lot along the way uh, about capacity and measurement and accuracy and how long things take and what tools you can use. And those are all things that you learned because you wanted to make a box. Right. And so next time you come to us, right, we're like, okay, made a box last time. We're going to do this time. I'll make a step ladder. Okay. All right. Steps tool. Time. Great. Awesome. I'll make a table. Awesome. Great. Let's do it. Um, And like, it was a really fun game of trying to realize, okay, just how much of your ambition can we support? So when a student comes in or, you know, a camper or something comes in and they're like, okay, I want to build a table and they're here for a one day camp. And you're like, okay, all right. Uh, right. You've never been here before. I've never seen you use a tool. Like you seem kind of really scared by what's really going on. Maybe the table isn't your best first day project. Right. But like there's other kids who'd come in, they're like for one day camp. I'm like, oh yeah, oh Parker, great. Yeah, like I've had you a dozen times. I know what you can do. Can I build, build a table today? Great, go do it. And then if you have any questions, just come ask me because like I know you can use a jigsaw, you can use a hammer, you can use a drill, you can use a driver, you can use uh, modeling software, like everything that you know you can do, like I'm already convinced by. Yeah, and, and so, he knows he can do it too. Like the, the difference between those two are like one has an aspirational goal of it'd be really awesome if I could make a table Mm -hmm. And the other one has a goal of, I'm going to make a table today Mm -hmm. and here's how I'm going to do it. It, It's funny because like my best moments at Bitspace are the same kinds of moments that are my best moments at Greenfields. Uh, The the second place best moments are like, I think the ones that a lot of teachers talk about, which like those aha moments, right? When like a student finally understands something, but the best moments for me were when a student realized something And I mean that in both ways of like, they realize that they can, right? Like that there is a, like something happened in their brain. I swear you could see it on their face when it happens, right? Like it's visible. Like the second before they were timid and unsure. And then like it washes over their face that they're like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. And like that timidity and and anxiety or apprehension turns into excitement and enthusiasm. Uh, And it's when that moment happens, when like you see that wash of empowerment over their face, uh, that I, I don't know, man, that's, that's the best feeling. Um, well, those, those, are, if- those are transformational moments in some cases where it's not like you help them to make that table or that skateboard or whatever, but you've helped them to realize that they are capable and powerful people. And mm-hmm. it's not about the next time that they want to make a table again, I can make a table. Mm-hmm. It's, oh, I need to go tackle this thing I've never done before, but I want to. I, I know I can do this. And that's a, that type of authentic confidence. It's not about a participation trophy or anything else. It's like, and to your point, you can see that happen. And the, at Greenfields, one of the things and, you know, that I've seen happen and I imagine you have is when young people first start there, they have some of that, like, I don't know, middle school slouch, I'll call it, where it's like, <laughs> kind of like eyes down, don't look at anything, you know, kind of like that closed yeah. in on yourself type thing. And then after, after a month or two, like the, the way they hold the muscles in their face changes, the way that they, they walk changes. The, and it's because of that newfound confidence about who they are as a person that changes. And I think when you can make those types of changes in someone, that's not something that goes away after a test. That's something I, that stays with them forever. I think it's actually, it's even more than what you're saying. Uh, you're using the word confidence. I think it's even more than that. I think it's like, it's self-conception, right? Like their vision of who they are 
and not even like who they could be, right? But who they are right now. I haven't been in high school in what feels like ages, um, <laughs> but like, you know, career counselors and stuff. And they're always telling you, you know, what you're going to be when you grow up and what you're going to be and who could you become? What career could you have? And like, that is a very relevant question. But like, okay, how about you ask, like, who do you want to be right now? Right? Like, what do you want to become today? Mm-hmm. Right? And that's a question I get to ask at Greenfields on a very regular basis. Um, especially in things like passion project, right, which we're working through right now. Um, and like, uh, to, you know, to bring it back to my previous teaching experience, like I'm definitely applying my understanding of what you can get done in a week, um, from Bitspace to passion project where I'm asking them to do things every week. And obviously there's huge modifications, you know, cause like there we had a huge tool shop. We had us on hand. We, you know, it wasn't a lockdown <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And we also had uh, about 35 hours is what we sort of like said, like, you know, if, if we, if we measured the time from Monday morning to Friday, uh, show off time, how long do we have is 35 hours? And, you know, we have more like four to six really of actual work time for a passion project in a week, but the principles are the same, right? Set a goal, break it down, um, every morning or every afternoon in our case, say, what are we going to do today? Right. Put that post it up or in the case of like online learning, put it on Trello, right? At the end of the day, talk about what you hit, what you didn't hit, celebrate successes, do a show off stuff, get everybody excited, right? Like the process is the same. So if you like what you're hearing or you don't, and you want to come on and talk about it, go ahead and visit uh, greenfieldsacademy.com and uh, and let us know that you want to be on the podcast and you you want your opinion to be heard. I'd love to hear from you. And um, it sounds very agile. Yes. I mean, it's, um, I've actually, I've actually never worked officially as a programmer, um, in like, well, sorry, I should say I've never worked, uh, as like a programmer at like a development company, right. Uh, or, or a game studio, which was my dream for a long time. Um, I worked extensively as a programmer at Bitspace, uh, creating libraries and software that like 10 year olds can use that sort of translates like 30 year old knowledge into 10 year old usability cases, right? So that they can like, I can write really complex code that manipulates an object in 3D space, but it has like six buttons that you could press that'll program what it does in the game. Like that was like, that was my programming role. And that was awesome. And I thought that that meant, uh, there was a time I thought that meant that like what I want to be as a game programmer to like make things move in 3D space. And then I, it took me until like my last year at BitSpace to realize, oh no, I don't want to make objects move in 3D space. I want to enable others to make objects move in 3D space. And like, that was the part where I was like, oh, right. It's the, it's the teaching, it's the guiding, it's the mentoring that's really important to me. That's a different sense of satisfaction at the end of the day when it's like, ooh, I finished these three lesson plans that we're gonna, someone mm-hmm. else is going to execute versus, hey, I just did this amazing birthday party with uh, these, these young people who did this unbelievable thing. It was just, mm-hmm. you know, and that ability of coming together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I had a lot of those moments. I had this like young lady, I think she was 13 when I first met her and like, she was going to join summer camp. And I like literally got a call from the parents being like, look, you know, uh, our daughter, she's a real troublemaker. You know, she's been kicked out of like three schools and like two camps already this summer. So if you need to kick her out, don't worry about it. It's okay. She had a lot of anger issues. Like we can't do anything about it, you know? And it was just like, wow, okay. Like who's going to show up on Monday? Right. I was like legitimately really scared. Sure. And, and so I met her and I'm like, okay, like she is, she is like a nonconformist, uh, feisty young lady. Uh, she actually had this, like, she had visually looked kind of like the, the young girl from brave actually funny enough with like curly <laughs> red hair and right. like, it just like, I'm going to shoot for my own hand. Right. Like she definitely, like she's hot from the hip. She had her own opinions. She was really, really intelligent. No question. And like, clearly what was happening is that like the places that she was being sent to just couldn't contain her and give her enough interesting stuff to do. So like over the course of the next like couple of weeks, first off she stayed Right. And like her parents were like, what is happening? And then she flourished. Right. And yes, she caused trouble. She had anger issues and stuff. But like, I just like spoke to her to like like a human being. Like when she had things that she wanted to say, I would just like take her arguments and like argue with her on the points that she's making. And when she's like causing trouble, I'm like, wait a second. Like, are you actually like helping yourself? 
by causing this trouble? Or are you just like expressing anger that's actually not directed at this person that you're expressing anger at? And she's like, whoa, okay. No one's ever talked to me like that before. <laughs> right. And like, uh, I had this experience where she came back like six months later for like a, just a one day over winter break. And she came in and she made this like really beautiful wooden object, you know, that she just like spent the entire day like carving and sanding and shaping. It's like a Zelda sword, you know, from cool. uh, Link's sword from Zelda. Um, it was beautiful, right? No question. It was a legitimate product of excellent work and a good day's work. At the end of the day, like she was being picked up and I like, I opened the door to let her walk out and she like was walking out to her mom, stops, turns to me, smiles and hugs me. And I like, I just about melted like a hundred percent, right? Just completely melted. And her mom, like, while she's talking to me, looks at me and just like is a gape. Just like, what, what, how is this possible? And it just, I don't know. It just, it seems, it seems obvious, you know, just treating somebody like a human. You know, I, I had the benefit of having a number of, of teachers and professors along the way, which encouraged me to sort of express myself. Um, and I think I sort of look at my job as how can I best be the teacher I wish I had um, when I was young. What's a role as a guide? I had a good friend of mine, Amy Ewalt. She is, she's, she started a preschool and she's been a teacher for most of her adult life. Uh, she's currently at the Scuola Italiana. She told me that there's, there's three things you need to do uh, as a teacher. Um, and they're keep the kids safe, let them have fun, and then teach them. They, hopefully they learn something. So it's like, you know, safety, fun, learning in that order specifically. Right. Um, and the reasoning is such, if they don't feel safe, they can't express themselves in any way. Right. Because then it's fear driven, uh, or authority driven. And if a student, if a child can't express themselves, then you are asking them to be a robot. Right. And like, we don't need more robots. Well, we do need more robots, but we don't need more human robots. Right. Like we need people who can think creatively, who can make decisions, who can investigate, uh, who can be curious. And I don't mean just now, but I mean, you know, I can't tell you what the world's going to look like five years from now or let alone 20 years from now, like what the definition of a job will be by the time I'm retiring is an utter mystery to me. So I need them to be able to like make some decisions on their own. So safety is paramount, right? It has to be a safe space. And for bit space, that meant like physical safety, uh, first and foremost. And then like that sort of social emotional safety where it's okay to express yourself. It's okay to say, I have an idea. It's okay to ask a question. Right. And so the second thing is having fun because you have to engage and this does not go just for children. I think like this, this goes for like people in offices everywhere. Like you have to engage your mind and your heart in some way for you to commit and buy into uh, the place you're in. Because if you're not buying into, if you're not having fun, if you're not engaged with what you're doing, then it feels empty and you have to force it. Look, when you're like, you know, 35, 40, and you're just like trying to make it through the day at a job that you don't really like, you've probably developed the willpower. And you probably have like a back catalog of things you like. You probably have some self-care techniques. Like you've got ways of managing that. But like when you're eight, when you're six, when you're 10, when you're 16, like you don't have that yet. And like part of our job is to build up those things which means that like the experiences that you have, whether it's a bit space, whether it's a green field, like they have to be experiences that are going to give you life, not just now, but going forward. And then like, once you've established those things, like once you basically can make them feel like a human being, that's when you can start talking about, okay, like now that we're set, right now they're on the level. Now let's talk about, okay, where, what do I think you need to learn in order to actually move forward in terms of touch points? Those are the same three words. Um, safety, fun, learning, but they manifest in different ways in bit space and here. And in terms of like my experience as like an employee, right, as somebody who works at this job, uh, I think the biggest difference for me is the the time scale. Our interactions in bit space were uh, for the most part short term. Like there were a couple of kids that would come. 
uh, back for like long term for summer camp. Like I had a couple of kids up in uh, Wilmette where I was sort of mostly stationed who come for like six weeks of summer camp. Right. And I got to really know them. And uh, there were some who'd come for like our, our shop hours. They'd come over the course of years, you know, a couple times a week. Uh, but the vast majority of kids I met, like I knew for a day or a week. There, There's pluses and minuses to that. The, the, the pluses are, is that like, that means that I can keep our goals super focused on Friday or on the end of the day. So it made Whatever it, the exhibition time is. Mm-hmm, exactly. So like I, we actually had exhibitions on Fridays, um, <laughs> a, a development that I, I would be proud to say that I introduced. Um, but the idea was, is that like, okay, because it was so laser focused on the product, um, we can keep not just the teaching and the instruction, but also the enthusiasm uh, laser focused. And so it was like super high intensity, right? Um, and it also meant that like, if there was like a long term, let's say social emotional issue, right? We didn't have to deal with it uh, unless it like affected the day or the week, right? You had to survive it. You didn't have to solve for it. Exactly. Right. And like, that's the part that has been the biggest difference for me is that, you know, I am with uh, my Griffins every day for months and then, you know, going forward for years, right? Like I'm going to know uh, these kids for a long time. And so when something happens and it just kind of like doesn't get resolved, I can't just be like, well, we got to make it to Friday. Then I won't see you next week. And I could like, you know, leave a note with their parents about what happened and like let them and their school and their counselor or their therapist work that one out. But like here, like I'm in the position of like having to arrange more of that. And like proudly so. It was like near the end of my term at BitSpace where I started going to a therapist on the regular. As always, when you start a therapist, like late in life is always a slow start to kind of a ramp up to sort of like kind of believing in it, I guess. Like I believed in therapy, but like then there's like the act of living it. You know what I mean? But like it, it surprised me how quickly I started taking some of the lessons of like the changes I was going through and the, the noticing I was doing in my own head and my own heart and how much of that I was applying as lessons. And like, I think frankly, it helped me a lot personally too, because, you know, a lot of people say the only good way to prove you know something is by teaching it. And so like, you know, I was, I think I did something like 50 something weeks of camp, right? With an average of like over 10 kids per camp, usually 15 and then like hundreds of, of, of day off camps. Like I saw thousands of kids. And like, I think that like in some small way, like I've probably helped a whole lot of them try to like get through a tough time or get through like something stuck in their craw by just like asking the right question at the right time. And like, that was part of that, like feeling really good about myself. The thing is, is that when, when you've got that opportunity to do that over the course of a day or over the course of a week and you can like help somebody and you can feel good. But then like when you have to see that kid again next week, you know, and then you kind of have to like maybe do it again or like, Resupport them or say, actually, like, it seems like you're taking this the wrong way. Let's talk through it some more. Like that's, that's a lot, a lot more emotional labor than I'm used to. And it's frankly, it's pretty draining at times. I say it's probably like one of the biggest difficulties of being a guide um, is that because we're putting ourselves in that role, well, of guide, right? Like of, of mentor of like, you know, the person on the hero's journey who points you in the right direction, who points you at the problem uh, and who, who of course will then suffer the emotional effects of you refusing the call because that's how this works. Like having to go through that emotional journey over and over and over again, uh, is really tough. It's a lot. Um, it's also really award rewarding. And I think that those same moments of like the, the realization moments where you see a wash over the face, like you see like self concept grow or self concept change. And like, uh, frankly, I think I've seen it in a number of the explorers this year. Unless you might not know what an explorer is. Oh yeah. So the explorers are our middle schoolers, um, for the sort of general parlance. So, um, I, I really do think that there have been a number of kids who I have helped through a tough moment or helped learn more about themselves. And that's incredible. Um, and that is actually only possible because I am there every day, every week. Yeah, and that it, uh, it's easy to put the bandaid on, right. And feel good that you helped with the bandaid and you've calmed them in their moment of need. Unless you see them week after week, you don't know if that treatment was enough to actually change anything. Mm-hmm. And, so well, and also like, frankly, like, you know, if I was, I think like a regular stand and deliver teacher, right? Like I could create more of that space 
between myself and the students because like it is my job to deliver this lesson and uh and to to present you with everything that you need to like get a successful uh homework assignment or test or standardized test or what have you and like that's my my need of preparation so like I don't have to be as emotionally involved with each student on an individual basis. So it almost, it almost comes the other way because, you know, I'm going to give you everything I think you need. I'm going to give you the challenges that I think are the right ones. And then I'm going to grade you on your ability to do them. And mm-hmm. those grades don't reflect on me. They reflect on your ability to do the stuff that you should have been able to do. Mm-hmm. And I think it, it creates a huge distance between teacher and student. So, so like I've been saying this term that I, I think it was from a friend's therapist or something. I forget where I heard it, but like should is a trap word. Should is a trap word, (laughs) right? Should is such a trap word because word in the language. Cause, uh, cause for a number of reasons, but the strongest one for me is that the problem with should is that if you do do it, there's no celebration because you should have done it anyway. And if you don't do it, you feel like crap because you should have done it anyway. So there's just no winning. It's a lose, lose word. And it's not to say that I've managed to erase it from my lexicon. It's about finding that connection on like a personal level. I had this like a little moment. It was a few months ago now. We, uh, we do these circles at Greenfields, right? Where we sort of all sit together and uh, maybe we'll launch some topic or have a discussion. We basically just broke from one of these, right? I think it was a morning launch, if my memory serves me correctly. Now sitting next to one of my students, one of my Griffins, and I just turned to him and we just started chatting for a few minutes, you know, just about like stuff, you know, just like two, two equals, right? For lack of a better term, like I respected him and his views and what he thought was cool. And he respected me and my views. And like, there is a power dynamic there. There's age, and just physical size. Right. And there's also like, I'm an employee of the school that he goes to and all of these things. But like, it was such a powerfully like just person to person intimate moment. Um, and I was so happy that I got to have that moment, uh, with somebody who was so young because it was the kind of moment that I got to have with certain teachers when I was younger, where I got to feel like being who I am is okay, right? I don't have to change who I am. The things I like are okay because there's someone who I view as an important figure, an authority figure, um, values my thoughts and my experiences and my interests. And it it just, that was one of those moments where I, I sort of got to feel that from the other side and I was like, all right, you know, like, that was really, really good. And it's a, I wouldn't even say from an authority figure, it's from someone who you respect, right? Someone right. Yeah. Who more someone who's like value their opinion mm-hmm. and have them value your opinion as well is a, like a really rewarding circle. It's life affirming. Gosh, like the thing that like, you know, kills ambition more than anything else is like being told that like you should be something else or that you can't be who you are. And that's just, it's so tough to hear. Um, Who you are is wrong. Yeah. Like never say that. Right. right? And I mean, like, I, I think it's, you know, it's a short hop to like where we're at today on, you know, June 3rd of 2020 of like, I think a lot of the discussion today is like, okay, does anyone get to say that? What does that look like? What, what, what does that look like on a societal level? And it's, it's, a, it's, a really, it's a really important point that we never tell that to young children. Yeah, let alone to, well, we, we'll try not go the rabbit hole that we fell down before we started recording today was, a, was dealing with a world events through this uh, pandemic and what are now the, the protests and, uh, that are happening in uh, Chicago where we live. But uh, that, you know, young people aren't many adults, but they are full-fledged human beings, right? And they come with all of the wonderful possibilities and all of the the challenges that being fully human brings. Mm -hmm. Um, But we don't often get to let them know that, that Mm -hmm. I see you as a human. Yeah. Because they are under this constant pressure to perform, right? Mm -hmm. Whether that's at school, in sports, 
um, at home, at home right? doing the homework, doing the tests, doing all of it. It's this constant pressure to perform, to be something that other people want you to be, not necessarily anything you ever chose or wanted to do on your own. Mm-hmm. And so to, for an adult in your life to present themselves as fully human to you and mm-hmm. be vulnerable and talk about who they are and be willing to share those things um, really validates you that you are a human, that someone is there who cares about you and someone Agreed. is there who will talk to you. And I think uh, for a lot of people, that's what they need. I, I, I totally agree. I, I think that the, the word you use there, um, briefly, validation, is is crucial because it is about enabling you to not just even be your best self, but just to be yourself. Uh, like right now in this moment, it's funny because there's a number of like moments from even just the last 24 hours that I'm like, oh yeah, this moment where I did that and this moment where I did that. Like I did, I just did a launch, a circle where we're talking about the qualities of being uh, tender hearted and tough minded and how either of them to the exclusion of the other is damaging, but a, the right balance between the two is incredibly productive and is a leadership quality. And even though we talked about it as a leadership quality in like, you know, the video I showed and some of the discussion talking about pros and cons, like um, I made the explicit motion to say, this is something that you can do to yourself, right? Like you can be tough minded on yourself, but also warm hearted. So that in those moments when you are not having a hundred percent day. And I think like one of the things that, having a very stressful um, life environment does, right? Like where we have a lockdown and a pandemic and, and, and uh, protests in the street and that kind of thing is that it's very easy just for that stress, that world stress to get to you and to, to not be able to feel a hundred percent. And I, I think nobody is a hundred percent all the time, right? Cause like everybody's ups and downs, but in this time, I feel like we have to be kinder to ourselves about where we're actually at and how much we can actually handle um, and how much we can actually do. But that doesn't mean that we can let ourselves go. There's like, there is a balance to be struck. Um, and that's really, really hard to strike and even harder to show, right? And to guide someone towards. I think that's one of the things that make being a guide and being a griffin at Greenfield so difficult yet so long-term rewarding is the types of conversations that you lead can be heavy at times but they're also like really important and meaningful in ways that are going to or have the potential to shape who you are for a very long time Mm -hmm. and spending more time on that rather than the memorization or the test taking and stuff that happens in a more conventional school, Mm -hmm. I think is one of the things that really allows or speaks to our mission of focusing more on life skills than on school skills. Mm -hmm. Um, But it does. It's like when you talk about bringing in pieces from your therapy into like, imagine if instead of accumulating baggage in our youth, we were building up the tools to not only stop us from taking on baggage, but to like really be able to thrive, like how much further ahead. And so I think that's one of the, the model, one of the key points of the model that really helps people. And it also, I think it, you do feel more human coming out of a place like Greenfields um, in that like my whole being was spoken to. Mm -hmm. uh, And it's not about like, you know, warm, fuzzy, you know, everybody gets a lollipop type school. And sometimes we get painted with that brush. It is almost the opposite of that with the amount of like hard thinking and emotional putting yourself out there as well as cognitively, as well as, you know, in all these different ways that you're really stretching yourself into becoming more you. I agree. Um, I, I think that we're very far from some sort of sense of like, oh yeah, everything's great, just positive feelings. And it's like, I, I needle my kids a lot, right? Like I, I push them pretty hard. I'm constantly amazed by what they can do. And I know that they can do a lot, right? I don't actually know what they can do, but I know they can do a lot, each and every single one of them, right? And I think uh, perhaps even especially the ones that have not been treated kindly by other institutions, um, 
and to watch them blossom and grow is like, come on, that's the best stuff in the world. Right. Um, to watch somebody who's felt shy and unheard speak up and volunteer and generate incredible stuff. And, and I think that like, to your point about, you know, the kind of instruction we have, I think that there is a sense that like, you know, certain public schools or, or, or even more so private schools, maybe it's like very rigorous instruction in like these fields and traditional fields and STEM, you know, it's kind of like the new direction a lot of uh, public and private schools are going and making is entering there and all of that. But like fundamentally, like it is still like a, a sense of, of academic focus social emotional learning for the most part at most schools sort of stops right by like elementary school. I feel like we have just as much rigor, if not more than any public or private school you can name just our breadth or our understanding of how much you are taking in when you're a child is just a lot broader right? I think it's much more comprehensive as well. So that like, you are not just learning your times tables because you are learning your times tables, right? In, in an age appropriate way. But we also understand that at the same time you're learning your times tables, you're learning how to be a friend, right? And you're learning how to manage your emotions and you're learning how to find out what makes you feel productive and you're learning how to communicate with adults and you're learning how to manage an email address, right? Like all those things that I think are easily glossed over because they don't fit neatly into a test are really, really important to us. Um, and that's why I sort of stand by our model, right? It's, it's powerful. It's kind of like, you know, education is life, you know? Well, I mean, yeah, I think the, the sense that like uh, entrance questions for families, like, do you believe that being a lifelong learner is an essential life skill or essential part of your life. And like, I, I can't imagine saying no to that question, right? That's like so foreign to me. And like, I, I know this is partially because I've, I have like an indefatigable growth mindset. Like that is how my brain works. This like constant vigilance of like, what am I seeing? What am I noticing? How is that affecting others? What can I change? How can I improve next time? And, and I know that that's like a lot of work, but it's also, it is, it is also the process of being amazing. And I, I don't see how else you do that, right? You just try stuff. And sometimes trying stuff means taking on a huge project that takes you weeks or months. And then maybe it succeeds, maybe it fails. It doesn't really matter, right? Well, like what you matters is that like, you know, what, Again, to bring it back to the question, what skills did you learn in service of that project, right? And maybe sometimes that means that you are speaking to someone and you use the wrong pronoun, right? And you notice that and you correct yourself, right? And like that, that, is, that is the range, right? And like all of those are equally valid. It, is, it behooves us and is our duty to talk about all of those at school. Yeah, it's a, I, I really want to blur those lines between, you know, oh, this is a school thing and this is a life thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, because learning is happening all the time in ways that often we don't notice or pay attention to, you know, the, you know, what lessons are young people taking away in a conventional school where that is more rigid, where it's, you know, you do not spoke unless you're spoken to. Mm -hmm. You just stand in line to go to everything. Um, hall passes. Hall passes. You need to ask if you're allowed to go to the bathroom. What are the lessons that were really, that you take away from that? Is that I need to be subservient. Mm -hmm. um, if I do exactly as I'm told and don't create a fuss, then I'm going to get through this a lot easier. Um, you, those are also things that you are learning even though it's not part of the curriculum. I think it's, actually, it's worse than learning. It's internalizing, right? Like those are, they're fundamentally their methods of control, right? Like they're, and they're put there for a very good reason, right? When you've got 30, 35 kids in your class and you just don't have the time to give them each, you know, even 20 minutes of your attention that day, because 
it's just, it's not feasible, right? You got to plan for your class. You have to deliver your class. You have to answer questions. You have to have office hours. You got to plan for next week You got to plan for next year. Like, and then you got to have a chance to have lunch. Like it's just, it's, it's not something I discovered early on at Bitspace without being able to name it. And I was only able to name it this year is that teaching is basically just logistics, right? And it's, it's logistics on two fronts and as your own time, right? And how you spend that time and how you're able, like how much time do you have to spend on prep and planning and uh, confronting students, uh, celebrating students, right? Et cetera. And then also how do your students spend their time? So if I've got X hours in a week for core time, um, and if I ask them for two hours more work than they have time to do, that's not going to work. And that's on me, right? That's, that's not their fault. Right. Uh, or if, uh, if I ask them to, to design a deliverable to present to the group on Thursday and design that deliverable on Monday, and I look at my schedule and I say, okay, I'm asking them to allocate about an hour and a half each afternoon on this. And I've already used up half their time on Monday because I was launching this project and they've got maybe an hour before the presentation on Thursday, if they're super focused. Realistically, I've got like three to five the first week, four to six hours most weeks actually available to them to do that. So asking them to do a project that's going to take them 10 hours or 12 hours, is a, is, it's going to be a case study in failure and frustration. And again, they're going to internalize that like, I can't meet the standards that are being, I'm being held to and that I'm a failure. And that is demoralizing. Yeah, and that's and the, crushing. That's the difference we talk about between safe failures and unsafe failures, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Where a, a safe failure is where you put a big piece out there and a couple of kids are going to fall down. You help them get up, figure out what went wrong, mm-hmm. uh, you know, re-energize, help them get back on their, mm-hmm. on their path and give it a go again. Um, but an unsafe failure is where you just put out something that can't get done. Uh, and I think that to go back to the, the point about like, you know, hall passes and methods of control, like it, it's precisely there to like, it's engineered to reduce the chance of unsafe failures, right? Of students hurting themselves in the bathroom, right? Or like taking drugs in the bathroom or something or like skipping school or other things that are like, sort of like breach the contract that is forged between a school and a parent, right? And a school and a community. Because again, like your number one goal is keep everybody safe. So if you're not doing that, then like you've missed something. And so of course, like you put methods of control in there and standardization for the same reason so that you can like basically get through a lot of stuff quickly. And like, frankly, like, yeah, we kind of take a different approach, which is like, you know, like I think more student agency is important as to when and how they get through this stuff. And like, you know, I have a view that, look, frankly, in 20 years, it's not going to matter whether you finished fifth grade math or the content of fifth grade math in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, or sixth grade. Like, effectively, that won't matter. What will matter is whether you cared to learn it on your terms and whether you wanted to learn it because you found it useful. Because like you internalized the idea that this is good to learn, right? Like I think uh, any motivational speaker, psychologist will talk to you, talk to you about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivations. And like uh, the test is an extrinsic motivation, right? I want to get a good score on the test so I can get a good grade in the class. So my parents will be happy and I can get into a good college, right? Like that is the thinking in, in standardized education. Frankly, like, like I was that kid, right? Like th- that worked for me, right? Like that worked for me. Um, then also when I graduated college, I was like, well, what the heck do I do now? Because no one had ever asked me before, <laughs> you know, uh, no one had asked, ever really asked me what my intrinsic motivations were, or I was able really to squeak by without having to answer that question, you know, like, um, they were find ways of filling my time, you know, in a way that got me points. Um, and, uh, and so I, I think it's much more important. Like I, I find my role is much more, um, it is not my job to teach you fifth grade math because you can learn that in a million places. Khan Academy being a great one example of that, it's free. Like go, right? Uh, my job is to get you interested 
in improving yourself, get you interested in learning, to get you interested in the idea of a growth mindset. And, um, and I think that, you know, in the best case scenario that happens while we're in school and, and it happens so that like you are, you are learning those things when I give you the opportunity to, to learn those. Right. And you're learning them at a pace that is, um, I guess culturally acceptable or and all of that or, or faster. Um, but like I would rather have a, if I could have a student for a year and, um, and my choices were, this is a kind of like a, would you rather question? Like, would I rather have a student who like is acing all of their standards, but hates it? Would I rather have a student who is struggling in all those standards, but loves getting better? I would take the second student any day of the week. Right. And I would, and I, and I try to mold and enthuse students into that second category at every opportunity. Because if, if that's what I can create, then that's the environment I can create, then, then I've succeeded fundamentally. Yeah. It's, it's very much kind of the carpenter versus gardener type mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. you know, if I can create the right environment and the right systems, uh, people are going to flourish. If yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to make designers, right. And design thinkers and critical thinkers, you know, um, that's, that's, that's the system in the world I want to live in. And I, I think I had this like really, <laughs> this moment I was tearing, getting, tearing myself up early this week. Um, cause obviously there's the, the pandemic going on and, and protests and things. And the world seems really tough, right? Right now it seems really hard. Um, and, and I, I think that, you know, if you've been listening to what I've been saying for the past few minutes or 45 minutes, however long it's been, well, you, you, you probably could guess that like, I am a little disappointed, uh, by the lack of leadership in certain cases, um, in America right now. Um, and I realized during one of our launches, I looked around at the kids I have and the kids I've gotten to know over the past year. And I'm like, you know what? Like, the future's going to be all right. If they're running it, the future's going to be all right. I think we're putting it in really good hands. Frankly, a lot better hands than like our parents and we were. You know, like I think they're going to be much better stewards of the world and each other than we were ever taught to be. And that's, that's, that's who I want to be. I want to create people who believe in a sustainable future. And I don't mean a sustainable like environment. I mean like sustainable future, like a world where we can like live in peace. That's what I want to make. Well, I am uh, happy to have you on that wall, Pavel. I really enjoy having you be a guide at Greenfields and the energy and enthusiasm you bring in the heart. And uh, I think that all came out today. And thank you for, uh, for spending time with us. Thank you, Rob. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed what you heard, please subscribe and tune in next time for a fresh new episode of Education is Life.